Welcome back. Last week, we discussed all empires in the ancient era, and today we will follow this up with every single empire in the early medieval era, going from roughly 500 to 1000 AD. Now real quick before we dive in, what we consider an empire is a large and influential state within their own region. With that set up, we can dive right into the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire. After the collapse of the Western half, the Eastern Roman Empire would continue on, and in the first couple of centuries, they would continue to be the definitive power in the Eastern and even the Western Mediterranean. Under Emperor Justinian, they would have their final peak, reconquering much of the Western Mediterranean. But from here, the real decline would set in. Keeping control over Italy proved costly and difficult, while from the East, the Sassanid Empire would take many of the wealthy Eastern territories away. While the Byzantines did temporarily take this territory back, any hope for a long-term Byzantine reconquest would be dashed by the rise of the Rashidun Caliphate, the first in a long line of Muslim empires which would rock the Middle East. The Rashiduns would soon win major engagements against both the Byzantines as well as the Sassanids, causing the collapse of the later while pushing as far west as Morocco, building a very impressive empire. The Byzantines are also still there, but they spent the rest of this time period in chronic decline. Their full collapse though, does not take place in this video yet. So, we will revisit them next week. Back to the Rashiduns, they would soon face the first fitna, an Islamic civil war. Their main competitor were the Umayyads, who managed to overthrow the Rashiduns and establish the Umayyad Caliphate. They would soon launch a reconquest of North Africa, while also crossing over into Iberia establishing Islam in Europe for the first time. To the east, the Umayyads also pushed the borders further, establishing this massive empire. A crucial aspect of the growth of these early caliphates was their tolerance. By far, most of this newly conquered empire was Christian, and these Christians, as well as the Jews, were free to practice their religion in peace, only being required to pay a religious tax. The Umayyads though were very Arab-centric, and this was quite an issue, since by far most of their empire consisted of non-Arabs. This would cause the Abbasid Revolution, started in Persia. The Umayyads, unpopular and dealing with a succession crisis, would see their empire nearly fully overthrown by the Abbasids, who would then go on to form the Abbasid Caliphate. But the Umayyads were not gone, surviving in Iberia. From here, they turned Iberia into a center of learning and culture, with their capital, Cordoba, becoming one of the most impressive cities in the Mediterranean. The Umayyads would continue to rule over Iberia for about 300 years, even conquering Morocco at some point. But eventually, the title of Caliph only became symbolic, and the Caliphate would collapse into a bunch of smaller states. Back to the Abbasids, they would not expand as much as the other Caliphates did. Yet, they would still oversee the Islamic Golden Age, as science and literature flourished. On paper, the Abbasid Caliphs would remain in power until the 1500s, but territorially, the Abbasids would increasingly see territories break away, until, by the end of this video's time span, the Abbasids no longer held any territory directly, being relegated to spiritual leaders and figureheads for other empires. The death knell for the Abbasids would come from the Buyids, who were the first to rise to the status of empire in the post-Abbasid Middle East. There were a couple of other major states, like the Safarids, but these still had to contend with a powerful Abbasids as well as other regional rivals. These Buyids held hegemony over the Middle East for quite a while, while also controlling the Abbasid Caliph. But soon, a well-known nomadic invader from the East, the Seljuks, would destroy the Buyids. But they are a story for another time. For now, we will move on to the final Muslim empire for this video, the Fatimid Caliphate. Starting from the west, they would take advantage of a collapsing Abbasid and become the most powerful Islamic state, taking control over the Islamic holy cities. The full story of their collapse will be explored next video, but invasions from the east would rock the Fatimid state, and after a general period of decline, they also had to contend with the Western Crusaders coming in. These issues would cause the collapse of the Fatimids as well. Zooming out now, let's look at some other regions. 
Last video, we had no empires in the Americas. But now, we finally have a couple. In Central America, there are the Teotihuacan. We are still not sure if they were actually an empire, but Teotihuacan was, by far, the most powerful city-state for quite a while. Following their collapse, we find the first, without a doubt, empire of the region. The Toltecs. These Toltecs held about the same territory as the Teotihuacan, but their influence was very widespread. For about 200 years, the Toltecs reigned before collapsing after a religious conflict over whether or not human sacrifices were okay. Further south, we have the Andes Mountains, where we have two empires to discuss. The first are the Huari, controlling the entire coastline of modern-day Peru. It is debated how much of an empire the Huari were, but their cities had immense infrastructure projects, suggesting at least some centralized leadership. The Huari would eventually collapse after a long period of drought caused famine and depopulation. Their rival empire were the Tiwanaku, who were located slightly further south. Their status as an empire though is even more disputed. Unlike the Huari, few great infrastructure projects were found. No dynastic burial sites, etc, etc. Quite likely, the Tiwanaku weren't an empire, but a collection of city-states sharing the same culture. Hence, they will not be counted. Then, across the Atlantic, we reach our first Sub-Saharan African empires. The Ghana Empire starts around 300 AD, continuing for about 800 years. Impressively, barely changing their boundaries during this time period. The Ghana would convert to Islam due to trade relations with North Africa, and the exact reason for their decline is unknown. Some argue that a Moroccan military campaign destroyed the almost millennia-old realm, while others argue that there is no archaeological evidence that supports this theory. Whatever the reason, the Ghana Empire would collapse. To their east, we have the Kanem Empire, centered around Lake Chad. Coming into prominence after the 700s, they would control much of the region for a pretty insane 700 years. That's already a good showing for any empire, but... Upon the collapse of the Kanem Empire, it would rebrand into the Bornu Empire. While falling outside of the time frame for this video, this one survived all the way throughout the 1800s. An absolutely impressive run for the Kanem Bornu Empire. Moving to India, we have plenty of new empires to discuss. Following the decline of the Gupta Empire, the first to bounce back were the Aulikara Mawa. They would take advantage and gain control over all of northern India. But after the death of their ruler, the Aulikala would vanish as fast as they rose. Down south, the Chalukya begin as a powerful state in western India before rising to control the entirety of central India. Meanwhile in the north, the Stanishvara begin their rise to power, taking all of northern India. Their rule, however, would be very short-lived as they collapsed extremely shortly afterwards. The Chalukya, meanwhile, would get usurped by the Rashtrakuta, which is the first of three Indian empires of the era. The second are the Gurjara Pratihare in the west, while the third are the Pala in Bengal. These three would enter severe competition over northern India. First, the Gurjara would gain control over the north. Then, the Rashtrakuta would take their turn, as the two trade control for a little bit. The Pala would then also join in, before the Gurjara took it again. From here though, the Gurjara would decline and eventually fully collapse. The Pala to the east would continue for another 300 years, with a ton of ups and downs, before eventually fully collapsing as well. The southern Rashtrakuta would refocus on the south and continue on for centuries. Eventually though, they would decline and be cooed by the western Shalukya. These Western Chalukya, on their turn, would decline at the hands of our next empire. As from the south, the Chola Empire would rise. They are very old, tracing their origins all the way back to 300 BC. But their true rise as an empire starts now. They would directly conquer all of the east coast of India, but their influence stretched way further into Southeast Asia directly. The Chola would dominate Southeast Asian trade for about 200 years. The Western Chalukya would slowly decline and fade away from the spotlight, while the Chola 
despite declining massively, would remain a major influence over southern India for 200 years before disappearing. Our final empire of the region comes from Afghanistan, as we have the Ghaznavids. From Afghanistan, they would strike deep into India before also striking deep into Persia. But from a minor region in their north, another new empire was rising. Their full story we will save for next episode, but their conquests will once again uproot the entire power structure in the Middle East and beyond, destroying the Ghaznavids in the process. But the great tale of the Seljuks will have to wait for next episode. I'm sorry for the quick intermission, but by far most of you aren't subscribed. To keep up to date with the two videos I release every single week, consider doing so. Thank you. For now, we are moving north into the steppes. Again, I apply my criteria much harsher for nomadic empires than empires elsewhere, because it is very easy to create an impressive looking state in these regions. But one that absolutely bears mentioning are the Gokturks, also known as the Turkic Khaganate. Following extremely rapid expansion in the steppes, the Gokturks would manage to raid as far west as the Black Sea and as far south as Afghanistan while striking fear into the Chinese. A huge empire whose collapse would begin when the empire split in two. These two, in various forms, continued to hold some relevance, but they would fail to dominate the steppes like their parent state did. Let's now move on to the land of emperors, where we ended up with the Sui ruling over a recently reunified China. Last episode, most of our empires were in China. This episode, China manages to be slightly more stable, meaning we have significantly fewer dynasties to discuss. That is not to say that the Sui last long. They would get involved in disastrous campaigns in Vietnam and Korea, before collapsing into a series of popular revolts. But don't worry, just as the Sui disappear, the Tang swiftly reunified China. Finally, some stability could be found for the Middle Kingdom, meaning expansion was again possible. The Tang would conquer the north, hoping to pacify it and lessen the threat of Mongol raids, with the east being conquered for much the same reason. The Tang were absolutely massive and considered a golden age for China. The Tang would be interrupted by the Wu Zhou. This was a strange dynasty. Wu Zichan, the wife to a Tang emperor, would seize the throne from her sons, declaring herself emperor instead. This makes Wu Zichan the only recognized female emperor in Chinese history. Wu would reign for about 40 years, first as the regent to her son under the Tang, and then as emperor herself. Her rule was by all accounts good, continuing the Tang Golden Age. But by the end of her life, she was removed from power as the Tang returned. After this, the Tang would slowly decline as central authority was weakened. Internal rebellions, loss of territory, and massive population decline would cause a new period of division in China. But before we dive into that, let's zoom around China's neighbors. First, Korea and Manchuria. It's pretty hard to determine empires here. China is so immensely powerful that these regions are often overshadowed. Still, one nation deserves the title of empire, and they are the Gorgyo. Unifying the region around 950, they would rule Korea for about 200 years before fiercely resisting Mongol invasions to such an extent that they would survive in the south, managing to rebound later to their past borders. Already very impressive feat. But Gorgyo is also the founding state for Korea as we know it, with the name Gorgyo being the origin of our western name for the region. The Gorgyo would finally collapse after proposing an invasion into China, which led to a coup against the emperor, starting the most well-known Yozon dynasty of Korea. But they are for another time. We now move over to Japan. The start of Japanese empire is found under the Yamato, as most of Japan is unified. Their dynasty still rules as emperors over Japan to this very day. During this period, Many Chinese influences were making their way to Japan, to such an extent that the Yamato would begin calling themselves Nippon, or the Sunrise Kingdom, in reference to the fact that the sun rises in the east, which from China's perspective is Japan. For the rest of this time period, 
the Japanese would focus on conquering their home islands. Many more stories can be told, but we will save those for following episodes, as technically this Japanese empire survives all the way to the modern day. To move on to a completely unexpected candidate, we have the Tibetan Empire. Starting humble from Lhasa, they would soon consolidate control over the entire Tibetan plateau. By this point, Tibet was already extremely large, but their peak came when they struck south into the rich Bengal. While they would soon lose Bengal again, the rest of the empire would manage to stick around for a century more, at various points being the largest existing empire at the time. Eventually, they would collapse into civil war, which would end the empire. This finally brings us back to China. The Tang are pretty much gone, and the first new empire would form in the north, the Liao. Initially, they were a nomadic people, but they would reform themselves into a China-style dynasty, at their peak, having conquered much of northern China. Down south, and a bit earlier, the later Tang would attempt to continue the dynasty. They failed, as the later Jin, I mean later Han, I mean later Zhou, took control over the state. These later Zhou would manage to march down south before being overthrown by the Song. The Song are awesome. China in 1080 had the same productivity as Europe would 600 years later. The Song extensively utilized coal in a proto-industrial economy while increasing iron production by fourfold during their reign. On the map, they may be one of the smallest unitary Chinese dynasties which makes their accomplishments even more impressive. But in Manchuria, the Jin are taking shape, who will soon shake China to its core. But that is a story for the next video. For now, let's move on to Southeast Asia for the very first time. In 300 AD, we find our first empire of the region, the Funan, who held most of the coastline of the region for about 150 years, being a powerful naval civilization. Then, they would enter the Klein, refocusing on the east. Here, they would remain for another 150 years before fully disappearing. Down south to Indonesia, where we have the Srivijaya from Sumatra, who rose to not just control their own island, but also all their surrounding islands. And most impressively, pushing deep into the mainland as well. Their downfall would eventually come from competition with the Chola, who would raid them into oblivion. Back on the mainland then, we have the final empire of the region. Starting small, as a tributary to the Srivijaya, the Khmer would take advantage of a civil war in neighboring Chenla. This would start their rise to power, as they soon expanded further and further. The Khmer would manage to rule most of Southeast Asia for 600 years, controlling this massive region at their peak. The Khmer would then slowly decline over another 200 years, before fully disappearing. This Khmer Empire is the one we know from monuments like the Angkor Wat. And with that out of the way, we can finally move over to Europe. And to be honest, after the fall of the Roman Empire in the West, a bunch of smaller states emerged, none of which can really claim the title of empire yet, considering the unstable nature of the post-Rome world and the heavy infighting between these states. But this one in the lowlands will be our very first Western European Empire, the Franks. Soon, the Franks would unite all of Gaul, well on their way to empire. But sadly, they had a really annoying habit of breaking apart upon the death of each monarch. This greatly hindered their ability to truly become an empire. But when their empire status could no longer be denied, is upon the ascendancy of Charlemagne. Upon the start of his reign, Francia was once again divided, but after the suspicious death of his brother, Charlemagne found himself in control over the entire region. He would go on to conquer India, push the border east tremendously, pushing to Iberia, and finally, turning all beyond the eastern border into vassals as well. The Frankish Empire became so big and influential, they would rival the Roman Empire of old. And the Pope agreed crowning Charlemagne as Roman Emperor in the year 800. This Frankish Empire would then pass on to Charlemagne's son, who would mostly keep it together. But upon his death, in true Frankish fashion, it would be split in three. Middle Francia would soon get partitioned between their brothers. And it is this East Francia 
where we will find our next empire. They would rebrand into Germany before taking up the imperial mantle again, forming the Holy Roman Empire. But their story will continue for the following thousand years, so we will come back to them next episode. For now, we will go slightly back in time, where we find the Avar Khaganate, your latest nomadic empire. They would come from the east, causing absolute devastation to the Byzantines and northern Italians. Being so devastating, that the Byzantines practically lost control over the entire Balkan. Unlike most nomadic empires though, the FR managed to last quite a while, before finally being destroyed by Charlemagne, who was sick of Avar raiding upon his territory. Avar actions in the Balkans though, have opened the door for another empire, the first Bulgarian one. Taking advantage of Avar decline, the Bulgarians would establish an impressive empire, looking like this at their peak. They would then focus on the south, almost toppling the Byzantine Empire, becoming the most powerful empire of the region, before entering a period of decline and being reconquered by said Byzantines. With that, we have already reached the very final empire of this era, who are the definitive Eastern European power for about three centuries, being the founding state of Ukraine, Belarus and Russia. The Kievan Rus would turn the Rus Orthodox Christian, allegedly because their ruler decided against Islam because it didn't allow alcohol while the Rus would eventually devolve into a series of loosely connected principalities, they would still last for over 400 years, before finally being invaded and conquered by the Mongol Empire, who we will discuss next episode. That leaves us with this as our final map of areas ever controlled by an empire at its peak. These were all the empires at the end of the Ancient Era video, meaning these areas in red have now finally been empire-fied. More interestingly, this is the map of every empire in the ancient era overlaid, with a heavy focus on China, the Middle East and India. Now here is the map of every early medieval empire overlaid. We can see that a major new region forms around the Muslim caliphates, while India and China are still hotbeds for empire. But most of all, we can see that there is now a much wider spread of empires as we move away from just these heartlands. But for now, we are done. Subscribe to join me next week as we explore empires in the later medieval era from roughly 1000 AD to 1453. Thank you all for watching and if you enjoyed the content, consider clicking on one of the two videos on screen now.